All right, so in chapter 10, we are going to start talking about some generalized ideas of functions. So when we first started talking about functions in an algebra class, we required that functions pass the vertical line test, i.e. that they couldn't go straight up and down or they couldn't move left and right simultaneously. Well, it turns out, in reality, that description is not good enough. So we're going to need to generalize our notion of functions. So that's going to be our first goal in chapter 10. And as we move along, we're going to introduce some other coordinate systems to go along with these. So, so far, we've dealt with what are called rectangular or Cartesian coordinate systems, where we have an x direction and we have a y direction and we move in each. Turns out, there are many different coordinate systems. In fact, in Calc 3, if you take that class, you will learn how to invent your own coordinate systems. You can change to about anything you wish. But we'll talk about some important ones later on in this chapter. All right, so our big idea is, if we look at our function here in blue, you say, well, wait a minute, Professor Peterson. That's not a function. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. Well, we're going to redefine our function just a little bit. So it's easy to imagine a situation where um, a person may need to follow such a path. If we describe both x and y as a function of time, we would get x equals f of t and y equals g of t. This pair of, equ of equations are um, parametric equations. Note that both x and y are functions of a common third variable t called the parameter. So the idea is, now, these two parametric coordinate functions, so x equals f of t and y equals g of t, these will satisfy our old definitions of a function. So we want to then talk about how we would make this graph. Well, then every value of the parameter would determine an ordered pair x comma y. So in terms of this, we would put different t values into both x and y to get different ordered pairs x and y. All right, so let's see how this is done. So example one, sketch and identify the parametric equation x equals negative 2 and y equals t squared minus 4t. So when we first learned to graph in algebra, we used to make xy tables, right? So we'd make our t table, as we call it, and we would put our x value and our y value in. Well, it turns out for these, we need to add one more. So when we make our table, our inputs are actually going to be t's. And we're going to get x's and y's for our outputs. So in this sense, our input is going to be a t. And each of these is going to be an output. Because remember, each coordinate is represented by x equals f of t and y equals g of t. So then, <clears throat> oftentimes when we represent things like this, t will be time. If that is the case, t will start at 0 and move forward in time. That doesn't always have to be the case. The parameter doesn't have to be time. As we will see, you can parameterize by a lot of other things as well. But oftentimes, time is the default parameter, in which case we'll start with 0. So we'll pick some different values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so forth. So then, <clears throat> if I were to then put these 
values of t into each of my equations. So right here, my x equation is t minus 2. So this would be 0 minus 2, which is negative 2. This would be 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. This would be 2 minus 2, which is 0. 3 minus 2, which is 1. 4 minus 2, which is 2. And 5 minus 2, which is 3. And then we would have to do the same thing with our y. So in this case, then, we would have 0 squared minus 4 times 0, which is 0. 1 squared minus 4 times 1 is 1 minus 4 is negative 3. 2 squared minus 4 times 2 is 4 minus 8, so that's negative 4. 3 squared minus 4 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 3 is 12, so 9 take away 12 is negative 3. 4 squared is going to, um, 4 is going to be 4 squared minus 4 times 4, which is 16 minus 16, which is 0. And 5 squared minus 4 times 5 is 25 minus 20, which gives us 5. So then our set of ordered pairs that we would need to graph would be the following five, or six rather, ordered pairs. So our x for the first one is negative two, and that negative two pairs with zero. And then we would have negative one, and it pairs with negative three. We would have zero, and it's gonna pair with negative four. Our next one is we're going to have one. And one is going to pair with negative three again. Our two here is gonna pair with zero. Two and zero. And our last ordered pair would be 3 and 5. So now let's go ahead and plot these points on our original graph. So you would have negative 2 and 0, negative 1 and negative 3, 0 and negative 4, 1 and negative 3, 2 and 0, and 3 and 5. So we play connect the dots, and our graph looks something like this. So with parametric equations, we actually get more information. Because we started at t equals 0, so this was our starting value. And then we moved along the graph in this direction. So our traditional y versus x graphs don't have a direction associated with them. So that would be our path that this followed. And that would be the graph of that curve, x equals t minus 2 and y equals t squared minus 4x. All right. <clears throat> Turns out we can eliminate the parameter. by using substitution. So in our previous example, we had x equals t minus 2, and we had y equals t squared minus 4t. We could solve this first equation, x equals t minus 2, for t. 
by adding 2 to each side. And that would give us t is equal to x plus 2. Well, if t is equal to x plus 2, then y would have to be equal to x plus 2 squared minus 4 times x plus 2. If we were to then graph that on our graphing calculator, x plus 2 squared minus 4 times x plus 2, and compare that to our graph that we got up here, we'll see, indeed, we get the same parabola starting here at, here goes down to 0, negative 4, comes up through 2, and then goes up and off forever. So in certain situations, we will be able to eliminate the parameter and recover one of our old style xy functions. When we do this, we lose information, right? Because this graph doesn't have any directional information associated with it. It doesn't tell us anything about time. So parametric equations carry more information than the standard x, y, because they also have a time or a parametric coordinate that tells us where something is. It gives direction to an otherwise directionless graph. So continuing, if we really wanted to, we could expand this out and simplify. So x plus 2 squared is x squared plus 4x plus 4. Distributing that in is minus 4x take away 8. So then collecting all of our like terms, we would get x squared. These reduce out, and 4 take away 8 is negative 4. So that's our standard parabola shifted down 4 units which once again agrees with our graph that we have here. So our regular x squared function just moved down four units. So let's go ahead and do this. So as we graph this, at first glance when we look at this, I have x equals 2t cubed and y equals t cubed minus 5. And we're trying to build up our intuition about, well, what's this going to look like, right? So let's see if we can figure it out. Sometimes it's a little surprising until we think about it a bit more. So we have t, we have x, and we have y. So we're going to pick 0, 1, and 2. Zero's easy because 0 cubed is going to give us 0. So 0 cubed times 2 is 0. And then 0 cubed take away 5 is going to be negative 5. So that gives us our first point, 0 and negative 5. And then we go to our next point, 1. That's 2 times 1 cubed. Well, 1 cubed is 3, or 1 cubed is 1 times 2 is 2. And then we have 1 cubed take away 5 is going to be 1 minus 5, which is negative 4. So that gives us the point 2 and negative 4. And then we go ahead and we try 3, or 2, and we have 2 times 2 cubed, which is 2 to the 4th, which is 16, and then 2 cubed take away 5, which is 8 take away 5 is 3. 16 is off our graph. I mean, we could go way out here and try to plot it, but that didn't work so well. Well, what's making our numbers get so large very quickly? What are we doing to our input values of t? Cubing them. So why don't we try something a little more creative? Let's go with, say, the cube root of 
4 for t. The reason for this is, do we actually ever plot t? No. Do I even care what the cube root of 4 is? Mm, not really, because it's not going to show up. So we're going to have 2 times the cube root of 4 cubed. Well, the cube root of 4 cubed is going to be 4, and 4 times 2 is 8. And then we have the cube root of 4 cubed take away 5. So that's going to be 4 take away 5 is negative 1. So that gives me the point 8 and negative 1. If I wanted to, I could do the cube root of 3 as well. And you know, a whole bunch of other numbers if we really cared. So let's go with the cube root of 3 just for fun. So if we do the cube root of 3, that's 2 times the cube root of 3 cubed. So the cube root of 3 cubed is 3. 3 times 2 is 6. And the cube root of 3 cubed take away 5 is going to be 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So that gives us the point 6, negative 2. So now, if I play connect the dots, what does my graph look like? Looks kind of linear. Yeah, it's exactly linear, right? <laughs> so we get a line. So that's interesting. In this parametric equation, we ended up with a line even though we had cubes. Well, the reason for that is, is the rate of change of these two things is equal. The change in y over the change in x is going to be a constant. And if you think about it that way, What's our change in y going to be? So our differential dy would be 3t squared dt. And what would our differential dx be? Well, 3 times 2 is 6t squared dt, right? And what's slope? The change in y over the change in x. So that would be 3t squared dt all over 6t squared dt. Whole bunch of things cancel out. And 3 sixths reduces to 1 half. It's the slope of the line we just found. Up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2. Oh, it's a half. Interesting, right? So the idea here is that parametric equations aren't going to draw the same graph as their regular two-dimensional counterparts, right? The graph of x equals t cubed, if you graphed an xt graph, would be a cubic function, right? It's going to grow really fast. But what we're seeing is y is also a cubic function. So they're going to be growing at a constant multiple rate of each other. In fact, what was that rate? Well, y is half of x, because x is 2 times, right? So we get our slopes here. OK, a couple of other things we might notice then. We could do the same thing we did before. We had x equals 2t cubed and y equals t cubed minus 5. If I solve this first equation for t cubed, t cubed is the same as 1 half x. If I substitute that into this equation, I get y equals 1 half x take away 5. Oh, that's exactly the equation of that line. And what's its slope? 1 half, right? So the good news is when we look at parametric equations the right way, our intuition will be helpful. But we have to remember that they're functions of some third variable. And in a certain sense, that third variable, or our parameter, is going to affect how x and y are related to each other. All right. So let's take a look at a couple more things. And we have a definition on our way.
So as we saw in the example and in the U try, curves with parametric equations have an initial point. So the initial point is whatever the smallest value in their parameters domain is. As we said, oftentimes it's going to be 0, but we can specify almost any interval we wish for that parameter, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. So if we have x equals f of t and y equals g of t, for a or for t between a and b, our initial point would be f of a, g of a, and our terminal point would be f of b, g of b. So let's analyze our curve here. So what curve is represented by x equals cosine t and y equals sine t for 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 2 pi? So before we start graphing, what do we think this is going to look like? Okay, so let's hold on to our picture in our mind. Turns out we've seen this somewhere before and we'll make a connection in a minute. But let's find our initial point. So our initial point is going to happen at the smallest value in our domain. So that's when t equals 0. So our initial point is going to be x is equal to the cosine of 0. And the cosine of 0 is 1. And y is equal to the sine of 0. And the sine of 0 is 0. So our initial point is going to be 1, 0. Our terminal point is going to occur at 2 pi. That's when t equals 2 pi. So that's going to be x equals cosine 2 pi. And the cosine of 2 pi is also 1. And y equals the sine of 2 pi. And the sine of 2 pi is also 0. Oh, interesting. So in this case, our terminal point and our initial point are both the same point, right? Both the point 1, 0. So now we need to test some values between 0 and 2 pi. Well, let's pick some boring ones. Let's go with pi over 2. So if t is pi over 2, then x equals the cosine of pi over 2. And the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And y equals the sine of pi over 2. And the sine of pi over 2 is 1. So this gives us the point 0, 1. Let's test t equals pi. That's x equals cosine pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. And y equals the sine of pi is going to be 0. So this gives us the point negative 1 and 0. Testing our next one, let's go with t equals 3 pi over 2. We get x equals cosine 3 pi over 2. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. And y equals the sine of 3 pi over 2. And we're going to get negative 1. So that gives us the point 0, negative 1. And then our next pi over 2 up would bring us back to 2 pi, which we already know, right? So what would this look like if we were to graph a picture? So 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1. So let's see. We start at the point 1, comma 0, and then where do we go? We start at 1, 0, and then we go to 0, 1. And then we go from 0, 1 to negative 1, 0. 
And then we go from negative 1, 0 to 0, negative 1, and then back to here. Ah. What is this a graph of? Ah, specifically, it's the unit circle, right? Ah, y is sine and x is cosine on the unit circle, right? So this parametric equation is actually the unit circle. Right? Takes us counterclockwise around the unit circle as our angle increases. Okay, so turns out that we can do something similar. So in these other two examples, we were able to quote unquote solve for a variable, substitute it in, and eliminate the parameter. Looking at this example, x equals cosine t and y equals sine t. Well, if I solve for t, I'm going to end up with t equals the inverse cosine of x. And then I've got to try to put that into sine function. That's not going to work out very well. So there's a technique that is helpful when we have trigonometric functions. We know things about trig functions. Specifically, we know identities. So what trigonometric identity do we know about sine and cosine? That's our good friend Pythagoras, right? So So the Pythagorean identity tells us that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1, right? Well, in this case, we have our x is cosine t. And we have our y is sine t, right? Well, if that's the case, if I know x equals cosine t, and I know y equals sine t, then I know the following. Well then, cosine of t squared plus the sine of t squared is going to equal to what? Well, that'll be sine squared plus cosine squared. And what does that have to equal by the Pythagorean identity? 1. But what is cosine the same as? Cosine t is the same as x. We have x squared plus what is sine t the same as? y squared is equal to 1. Oh, that's the equation of a circle with radius 1. centered at the point 0, 0, right? So if we have parametric equations involving trigonometric functions to try to recover a standard xy relation, we may need to use some trig identities like this that will help us discover what the relationship is between x and y. This time we used the Pythagorean identity because we had sines and cosines, and we knew that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. <clears throat> All right, so a couple of observations. When we sketched this circle, we went from t equals 0 to 2 pi. How many times did we go around the unit circle? One time. And which direction did we traverse the unit circle? Counterclockwise, right? Okay. So now your turn. All right, so when we draw a graph of this, our initial point turns out to be 
is 0, 1, because when t equals to 0, x equals the sine of 0, which is 0, and y equals the cosine of 0, which is 1. So our initial point is going to be at 0, 1. Our terminal point also turns out to be the same way because it's at 4 pi. What's the period of sine and cosine? 2 pi, right? So this is going to go and do whatever it does twice because it's going to go over the period of sine and cosine twice. So let's grab our graphing device and see. That is not what I meant to push. Let's grab our graphing device and see how we can get these values. So looking at each of our functions, we have x is sine. Let's put in our sine. And y2 I'll do for my y is cosine. So then if I made a table of values, this would be my corresponding first column would be my x's and the second column would be my y's, right? But specifically, let's go ahead and make our table a little bit better. So we go second window to get our table set. We want to start at zero, but instead of counting up by ones, let's count by pi over twos. And if we go second table, ah, that gives us some values to look at, and 6.28 is going to be our, our pi, or 2 pi. So that means we'll have been around the whatever it is once. So just to be clear, let's relabel these. So this would be our t, that's our x, and that's our Right. So if we were to draw our graph this time, 1, negative 1, negative 1, and 1, it looks like we start at 0, 1, which we knew, and then we go to the point 1, 0, which is down here, and then we go to our next point, which is 0, negative 1, so that's down here, and then we head back to negative 1, 0, which is up here. And then we circle back to 0, 1, and we start this journey all over again, right? So we started here at 0, 1. And this time, we went around the circle in a clock, clockwise fashion, right? And how many times did we go around the circle? Well, we don't actually see the final terminal point because it's the next one down on our calculator, but we get the idea that we got back to where we started and we go around again. If we wanted to, we could have used pi over 4, but that gives us um, 1 over the square root of 2, which doesn't show up very nice on your calculator. It's like 0.7 something, but we could use some different ones. So you're probably thinking, well, you know, that wasn't too bad. We can just put these in our calculator and generate input-output tables. The answer is yes, we can. But it turns out the folks at Texas Instruments thought about parametric equations in general. So let's take a look at something we can do on our calculator. So we did this using our old school XY tables. Well, there is a built-in mode that will be more helpful. So we're going to press our mode key. And if you go down four times, you'll notice we're right here on function. That's the standard xy table. Well, we don't want that. We have what's right next to it, which is par, which stands for parametric. So let's go over to parametric and press enter. And then after we do so, we'll go second quit. And now when I press y equals, you'll notice it looks a little bit different. What does it have in here? x1 sub t and y1 sub t. So when we press our variable button on our calculator now, it's actually going to insert t's, not x's. So let's go ahead and type this in. So if we go sine t, so 
So I'm still pressing my regular x, t, theta, n. We'll get to use all of those at some point this semester. We're going to use all those letters on there. So we've got sine of t, and then we've got cosine of t. And now this time, if we go second window to get our table set menu, this is where we control our parameter. So notice, where does our parameter start at? Zero, which is the normal default. And then we want to go to our delta table is um, 1.25. All right. So now if we go graph, we're going to get something that looks like this. We're like, okay, not very helpful. So let's zoom in. So zoom in two. And you're like, okay, that doesn't look like a circle. That's because our calculator doesn't use a one-to-one -one ratio. So remember, if you want to fix this, our calculator is in a four-by-three ratio, so it shears everything in terms of stretching. So if you press zoom, you'll notice choice number five says square. And if you hit five, it will make the pixel ratio one-to-one. -one. So circles will look like circles. This will also mess up your angles if you're trying to graph perpendicular things. Unless you use a square window, things that are at 90 degree angles won't look right because it's shearing the picture because it stretches it, right? Instead of doing a one-to-one, -one, it's graphing a four-to-three ratio, which really messes things up. All right. So you're still saying, well, I don't exactly know what's happening still. So when we go to our y equals... We can graph more things, and if we go to graph, we have table. When we go to window, now we'll notice there's some different things. So when we press window, t min is zero. What's our t max? Ah, but we wanted to go all the way to 4 pi, so we can change it in here. And then our graphing t step is 0.13, so forth. So you can mess with your x min, your x max, and your t step, and also your y min and your y max. So there's a lot more parameters in here than there was when we were in the x, y, because we can control t, x, and y. Remember, we don't actually graph the t's, right? They're just the inputs to our parametric equations. All right. So now when we graph, it's going to graph it again. You'll see it go around once, and then you see it think again for a while because it actually wrapped around the circle twice. And if we go second table now, we can scroll down and see what's happening. We'll also know some interesting things happen the further we get out. Because our calculator is using an approximation of pi, you start getting some numerical drift when you get out this far. So e to the negative 13th means you need to move the decimal to the left 12 times, so that number's like 0.00000000000001. All right. So we've been doing that same thing, but once again, we'll notice if we just square each of these, right? If you go sine of t, which is x squared, plus cosine of t squared, which is y, that's going to equal 1. So that tells us y squared plus x squared is equal to, or sorry, x squared plus y squared. My brain auto-corrected to which ones they should be. So x squared plus y squared still equals 1. So notice the regular x-y relation is the same thing. It's just a circle. But we didn't know where we started. We also didn't know which direction we went. In this case, we went clockwise instead of counterclockwise. So this idea turns out to be pretty important. So now imagine you're trying to shoot a missile at an airplane. If you just have the x, y graph of each of these and they intersect, does that mean the missile hit the airplane? No, for a missile to hit an airplane, they have to be in the same place. But more importantly, they have to be there when? at the same time. Because if the missile gets there before the airplane, it's going to miss. And if it gets there after the airplane, it's going to miss. So to hit the plane, they have to be in the same place at the same time. So this time component for parametric equations has many applications besides shooting down airplanes. So there are lots of things. I just bring that up because one of my favorite physics instructors, that was 
every single one of his problems, we were shooting missiles at things. We shot more missiles in that semester of physics than any one person ever should, but Dr. Pannon was awesome. But he liked to shoot missiles at things for story problems. So go figure. All right, let's take a look at our next example. Example three, we want to find the parametric equation of a circle with center HK and radius R. So the last two things that we've done gave us some hints on how this is going to go down. Well, what do we know is the equation of a circle with center HK and radius R? So it's X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared is equal to R squared. So that's the equation of a circle with center HK and radius R. All of our circle stuff seems to be connected to this idea sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1, right? So a couple of things we want to take note of. We want to convert this into this. Well, let's start by making a substitution. So if I let u equal x minus h, and I let y equal, sorry, not y, v equal y minus k, then this equation becomes u squared plus v squared equals r squared. And what does that look a lot like? Well, it's a lot like this, right? It's almost exactly that, our equation of a circle with radius 1, but this is actually the equation of a circle with radius r centered at 0, 0, right? After that substitution in the uv plane. Well, that would strongly suggest that what should u and v be? Well, u would be cosine t, and v would be sine t. And if we did that, we would get cosine squared t plus sine squared t. And we know that equals 1, but it doesn't equal r squared, which is what we want. So how would we fix this? That gave us 1 instead of r. So what if we change this by multiplying each of these by r. Well then, what would u squared be? Well it would be r cosine t squared plus r sine t squared. Factoring out our common factor of r squared from each of those, that would be r squared cosine squared t plus sine squared t, ah, which is r squared times 1, which equals r squared. Oh, that's exactly what we want, right? So then if u equals r cosine t and v equals r sine t, let's substitute back what we had in the very beginning. So then u is equal to x minus h equals r cosine t, and v is equal to y minus k equals r sine t. So then solving for x, we have r cosine t plus h, adding k, adding k, we get y equals r sine t plus so the parametric, no, I shouldn't say, a parametric, not the, because there's more than one. A parametric equation of a circle with radius r and center hk is given by 
x equals r cosine t. And y, oh, r cosine t plus h. And y equals r sine t plus h. So you can just memorize that fact, but that's where it came from is the idea. We shifted into the UV plane, then scaled our circle by multiplying by R, and then just substituted back to recover our original equation. All right, so now all right. So if x is sine t and y equals sine squared of t, well, that means y is equal to the sine of t squared. And if sine t is x, then what does y have to be equal to? x squared, right? So then we know that our equation is y equals x squared. If we grab our graphing calculator and we try to graph this thing, we press our y equals. So let's put in sine t. And for our next one, we have sine of t squared. And we graph it. We get something that looks like that. y equals x squared is a parabola. Why did we only get this teeny tiny piece when we drew the graph? Well, it has to do with our equation in its parametric form. Because remember, when we convert from parametric to Cartesian, we lose information. What do we know about the sine of t? What is the biggest value that ever comes out of the sine function? Well, when you're going around the unit circle, what's the biggest y value on the unit circle? 1. So sine t is always less than or equal to 1. And what's the smallest y value on the unit circle? Negative 1. So this tells us negative 1 is less than or equal to sine t, but sine t is x, which is less than or equal to 1. Oh. Where does the domain of our parametric equation go from? Negative 1 to 1. So then our y value, sine t, is non-negative, sine squared. So 0 is less than or equal to sine squared t. And 1 squared is still less than or equal to 1. And you'll notice that's why sine goes between 0 and 1. right? We can plot all of these things. But one thing we have to be careful with is converting from parametric to regular Cartesian is nice, but we lose information. So if we just graph whatever it gives us, we may not get the right graph, right? Because when we convert, we're losing a whole bunch of information involving our parameters and whatever functions made up those parametric equations. So just be a little careful when we convert. All right, so now we are ready for a pretty awesome example. So example four, the curve traced out by a point P on the circumference of a circle as the circle rolls along a straight line is called a cycloid. If the circle has radius r and rolls along the x-axis, and if at one position of p is at the origin, find the parametric equation of the cycloid. So this is like imagine you put a mark on the side of your tire at the very bottom where the tire is touching the ground. As you drive your car along the road, what curve does that dot on the side of your tire trace out? That's a cycloid, right? It goes up to the top of the tire. The tire spins around and it comes back down. And it starts all over again. So we go up to the top of the tire, back down, touches the ground. That's one rotation of the tire. The dot goes back up, spins back around, comes back down, two rotations of the tire, and so forth. 
that curve is called a cycloid. So let's see if we can find a parametric equation that represents this cycloid. So the cool thing about parametric equations is that we can break this down into x's and y's and treat them independently, which makes this problem a lot easier. One of our survival strategies in math is to break things down into smaller manageable parts. Okay, so let's start with this. So first observation we want to make is that the x-coordinate starts at the center of the circle, right? And as our point moves around the circle, we're going to have something that looks like this. So when I move, when P moves from here to here, how far horizontally have I traveled? Well, as we were talking about, that's one rotation of the tire. So if the tire is rotated once, how far is it gone? Well, that's one circumference, or the arc length of the circle. So one circumference is going to be 2 pi r, or in any case, its arc length is going to be t um, r times theta. So our arc length is equal to r theta. So when we went through 2 pi, 2 pi r is the circumference of the circle, which is the tire went around one time. OK, so our x is going to be moving to the right along this. But at certain times, it's going to move forward and backwards relative to this. The other thing we want to notice is that the center of our circle is always going to be at height r, right? Because when your tire rolls on the ground, the center of your tire stays in the same place. OK, so we want to make a couple of observations about this. So let's go ahead and draw a blown up version of our circle. So we're going to do all of our math relative to the center of this circle. So One of the key things that we want to keep in mind is remember, in radians, arc length is the same as what? The measure of the angle, right? When you're at pi over 2 radians, that means that the arc length of the unit circle from 1, 0 to 0, 1 is pi over 2. So if I had a point that went from here to here on my unit circle, the length of that arc, or how far it's went, is going to be theta, which is going to be the same as this angle, because our arc length for the unit circle, our r is 1. So we're going to get a very nice relationship here on our circle. So when we went around once, that's going to be 2 pi, like what we've talked about. So the length of this arc, r times theta, is going to be theta, which is the interior angle by the definition of radians, right? So that gives us a reference angle that we need to measure. And that comes from the fact that it's in radians and arc length. So then, based on this circle, we look at each of these parts. So let's label this one in green, and we'll call that well, let's see, I used green. Let's label this guy here. All right, so then 
And if we call this guy y, because y goes up and down, and we call this guy x, because x goes right and left, let's see if we can write our relationship for these angles. So adjacent over hypotenuse is which trigonometric function? That's going to be cosine, right? Adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine theta is equal to adjacent, which is y, divided by our hypotenuse, which is r. So that gives us y is equal to r cosine theta. Similarly, sine theta is going to equal to x over r. So then x would be equal to r sine theta. So now we can finish up our equations using this. So x is the center of the circle. minus the red side of the triangle. And our y is going to be the center of the circle. Minus the green side. So then putting all of this together then we get x is equal to well the center of the circle is always at the arc length which is r theta in the x direction, so r theta minus the red side of the triangle, which is r sine theta. So then factoring out our common r, we get r times theta minus sine theta. So that's our x coordinate. y is going to equal well, the y center of the circle is always just r minus the green side of our triangle, which was r cosine theta. So then factoring out our common r, we get r times 1 minus cosine theta. And those are our parametric equations for the cycloid. So for radius r, we would get this. All right, I'll leave it to you guys to do the graph.